Tony, real hoopers know. Real hoopers know, Tony. This is the Iceman. This guy's been cool. This guy's been cool in so many ways for 50, for 60 damn years. And I have promised him that this is not going to be another one of those book tour interviews. <laughs> this is not going to have some of the dumbass questions he's been getting. Uh, we've got the Iceman. He's got a new book out, Ice, Why I Was Born to Score. It's available now. He's one of the greatest NBA players of all time. Look at the smile, the radiance on Tony's <laughs> face. Who's, he's very young, but still knows to respect what's respect happening the Iceman. here. Let's, he had that silky finger roll. Oh. That was beautiful. I used no, to wait, re- wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's meet the moment. Let's give him the McAfee intro. Yeah, yeah. Are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah, God! Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's uh, let's yeah. welcome George yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. One of the fifty greatest players. What? Yeah. A legendary finger roll. What? Yeah. One of the best yeah. nicknames of all time. Yeah. What? Yeah. George, yeah. the Iceman. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Let's go. I told you it wasn't oh, going to be one of those. I had to clap back at that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is nice to see you. Now, you, you. when did you know you were cool? When did you know? Because you knew. Well, you knew I, early. I still, I still don't know it. You know, I, I don't know I'm cool, man. I just try to be me. That's all. I, hey, I ain't never tried to be cool. But you did it by accident. I, I must have. <laughs> Can you uh, take us through why it is you decided to write this book, George? You did it with Scoop Jackson. Scoop Jackson has uh, done a lot of legendary authoring. Why did he choose you, and why did you decide to choose him? Why tell your story now? Well, you know, I I got a documentary coming out. You know, Um, they came to me and and said, George, why we're doing a documentary, you you know, let's do a book. So I decided and agreed with them to to do the book. Um, you know, I had a few, you know, guys that asked me could they write the book, but I like Scoop. You know, I I like Scoop for two reasons. Um, you know, one, he's an inner city young man, and I'm from the inner city of Detroit, so I felt we had that same kind of dialogue. You know, and that's what I wanted. I wanted somebody to kind of. If I say something, he can repeat it versus trying to figure it out. You know, he can understand it. So Scoop was good for that. Can you explain to the audience, and this is a broad question, what inner city Detroit taught you? (laughs) Taught me how to survive, you know, first of all. And it taught me that a single parent can raise a family. Um, my mom gave me um, morals, values, and principles. And with that structure, it helped me through life. Um, so I'm very proud to be an inner, sitter, an inner city guy. And I'm real proud of the woman that raised me because, you know, without her, I wouldn't have these values that I have today. What can you tell me about how she raised you? Discipline. Love. Um, you know, we, it was six of us. She worked her tail off because I didn't really get a chance to know my dad at an early age and mom kept jobs and we didn't feel like we were poor, you know? So having that type of love shown to you, you know, really was remarkable. You know, we always talk about heroes. She was my hero. And and that's kind of like what I talk about in the book also, you know. So mom was everything. When you watch the documentary, what are the parts of your story that you think are the most interesting ones? What are the ones that move you as you uh, as you watch? When you think I, how guys, how the ex-players felt about me, you know, that that was moving to me. And then to talk about recovery, you know, and the pitfalls, you know, that you run into as a entertainer, you know, and recovering, you know, them the aspects that really moved me um, and then my spirituality. 
recovering from, if you can explain to the audience, why, uh, why the need to show people something there that can be very vulnerable and not everybody can be trusted with? Well, because I don't care what everybody else can be trusted with. I'm telling my story, and I'm talking about how it affected me. And I'm not dumb. I know it affects a lot of us. And, and, you know, in our lives and everybody don't know everybody needs a somebody. And I could inspire somebody else to take the necessary steps to recovery. What came with being a star in the league that you weren't ready for? Wow. That lifestyle. The lifestyle no joke, you know, um, I come from nothing, you know, and to be thrust into a world that gobbles you up if you don't have, it's kind of like learning math. If you don't know how, if you don't know, <laughs> you know, the formula, you can't solve the problems, you know? So being in a situation where I had no idea what I was getting into as a 19 year old, you run into pitfalls, you know, so you run into wolves and sheep clothes, you know, so you run into all of these type of issues as a young person being threshed in a world that you're not familiar with. What's the one you remember? Charles Barkley says he would kill in his in the street if he saw his agent who stole money from him. Uh, when you say wolf in sheep's clothing, uh, what's the what's the story that comes to mind, or what's the what's the hurtful thing that you're remembering there, where you're like, man, I I should have known better. I was just a young person. I was taken advantage of. Well, you know, everybody that tells you they love you don't necessarily mean it's true. Love is being proved by time. You know, that game that we get involved in and not understanding it, a lot goes with it. So you trust people. You know, um, a lot of people let you down, you know, because of being that wolf in sheep clothes. You know, it's easy to trust somebody that they got a good con game. They sound good. You know, we I think a lot of us run into that aspect um, of, of these kind of situation in our lives, uh, any of us, you know, where I don't know, you know, I don't know. So I'm going to sound good to you and maybe you'll go for it. How many of us run into that in our lives? How is it that spirituality uh, helped you with recovery? Well, if you don't, you know, it's too kind of, desires that we have. We have a fleshly desire that we feed a lot. And then you have a spiritual one that you don't, you know, and that's the one that can save your life. That's the one that can guide you. That's the one that can give you understanding. That's the one that can, you can develop a relationship. See, I knew there was a God, but I didn't know he had a name. So I talk about his name in my book, and his name is Jehovah to me. The name of the book, for those of you who would like to read it, Ice, Why I Was Born to Score, it's available now. If I were to go with you right now, where would I find some Iceman posters? Uh, where in storage would I find some things that have you doing commercials as Iceman? Like, certainly you own some of these still, correct? <laughs> well, yeah, but I have a few Iceman posters left. Uh, but where is there? Uh, is there any ice in them? Is there a refrigerator? Like, where is there? Is it or is it just you on a poster, finger rolling? There is there a commercial campaign somewhere that I could check out? No, with no, it's, it's not. It's not like that. No, no. Okay. No, I, I think that part of my life is beyond me. I, I think corporate America is not ready to revamp my career and, 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 you know, and sell my brand in which I'm cool with it. You know, you'll um, do it yourself with your book and with your documentary. I have a producer here though, who is very disrespectful and he's been yelling about this for a couple of weeks and I want to bring in a real expert to discuss it with him. 
He believes that Wembenyama is going to ruin basketball and that he's not that good at basketball. He's just tall and he's getting in everyone's way and he doesn't understand why everyone is rooting for Goliath. I don't understand this whatsoever. That it's not fair that a seven- Cheating the game. That's right. Like Should it, be a higher it's hoop. It's not impressive for him to finger roll. It's not like when, when the Iceman did it. And so I wanted to understand- George Gervin had to go up against That's Titans right. at six foot seven and That's develop right. the right. world's greatest finger roll. That's right. Wembenyama just- goes on his tippy toes. That's right. It's a different game they're playing right now, and it's not fair. It does a disservice to the greats like George the Iceman Gervin. <laughs> do, I, do I have a question here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I take that as a cosign. I'm, I'm presenting that. And not you laughing I'm... me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> we will take that laughter as an agreement and as as an amen as well. You agree with everything that he's the saying there, correct? He is growing. <laughs> I take the fifth. Oh, <laughs> man, that, sounds, that sounds like confirmation. That sounds uh, yes. Ice man, you're dangerous. You have been snared. Action, leading the witness. You're going to get uh, aggregated. It'll sell copies of your book, Ice, Why I Was Born to Score. Uh, thank you, uh, Iceman. Thank you, George. It's nice catching up with you. Hey, man, appreciate y'all, man. Thank you, man. Great questions. Yeah, especially that last one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The last one that wasn't really a question, but you co-signed. <laughs> you did. Yeah. We all heard you. You're like... <laughs> 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 it's what the predator did at the end of predator <laughs> it's a great haunting laugh it is a laugh that would terrify all of us in a corn in a cornfield at midnight the ice man cometh <laughs> We really delighted him. A few days late, it feels a bit Halloweeny, does it not? It feels, yeah. I would like that to be my uh, by my door bell. I would like that to be what happens when somebody uh, somebody on Halloween or just, every day. Well, yes, especially on Halloween. Oh, I can feel the jealous rage of Chris Cody only growing after George Kervin totally agreed with me on Victor Wembanyama. He was he caught that. He didn't my, want to say it. Mike, you were leading the witness, and you know it. You mentioned his own name in the question to him. That's Carlos. an objection for me. He didn't deny anything, though. You pandered to the game is different, and he just – all the old guys are the always The game was no, real that was, you did it. That was – that was <laughs> – the good old days. Oh, always back. welcome for – always Joe Zagaki. Uh, Complicated leg legacy. <laughs> Joe Zagaki brought to you by Estrella Insurance. No, no. Star insurance if you speak American. I want to uh, ask you guys if so much has changed in the way that we connect to athletes in basketball specifically. I want to make it basketball because basketball has done a great job of marketing stories, personalities, the creation of stars – it's not face masks like football and just a couple of the positions. You can, in the modern age, create a brand for yourself if you're Dylan Brooks. If you're a player who's fine, who's okay, but you decide, I'm going to lean into any attention is good attention. Attention is the currency of the day. I will have a brand. A brand. The brand might be clownish. The brand might be I say things, but the brand is also I'm willing to be a villain and I'm willing to show up at games wearing a vest and no shirt because I'm going for wrestling villain character when most athletes are afraid of that. Certainly no athlete with bigger credentials than Dylan Brooks is willing to play the verbal clown game of I'm going to lock LeBron James down. I'm going to stare at him at midcourt. I'm going to disrespect his legacy and I'm going to make everyone look at him like he's a dad and corny because I'm the new player in town with the Rockets who's going to beat him by 30. The Rockets uh, of Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks beat LeBron the other day and at Center court, they're Lance Stevensoning it. They're staring at each other. They're staring each other down. LeBron's the oldest player in the league, and Dylan Brooks, who's been good, 
isn't respecting and has never given the proper proper deference and respect to what LeBron's career has been. And not humbled by what his offseason was like because he wasn't national embarrassment and you never really see the Grizzlies part with someone who was a key contributor and in line with their identity. Like they they welcomed that until it blew up in their face. But the, they made a whole big show out of saying that they weren't going to bring Dylan Brooks back. And LeBron, to his credit, uh, being the, the former NBA PA players rep that he was, you know, like he earned that contract. You earn whatever anyone pays you. And his contract was, Dylan Brooks's was talked about a lot in the media as a bad one because there's a salary floor and they had to, to meet some of those. But Dylan Brooks has been really good for Houston, especially when you consider his offseason. Yeah, I mean, the contract only solidified, like, I can do whatever I want. I can build this brand. It doesn't make a difference as long as I can play some defense. And it's really crazy because, I mean, Lance Stevenson, like you said, did do this first. He was really ahead of his time. The way they talk about players, like, the way Tony talks about Michael Beasley being ahead of his time and should have played in today's NBA, Lance Stevenson belongs in the now. But why are we making it a wrestling character and just not kind of? He just seems like he's just kind of that guy. Like you have, I, I don't think it's as orchestrated as you think it is. Oh, I'm just saying, someone who's willing to embrace publicly the authentic in them and not care that you're receiving them as an ass. Like that's after a very public humbling. It's a rare lane for someone to occupy. I remember uh, he had one of uh, a year ago before all of this when they were ousted in the playoffs he shot terribly and somebody just came up to him in a Starbucks and is just filming him and basically pointing out to him that he misses all his shots you're inviting that most athletes who walk around town don't invite that they they invite going to Starbucks and having someone fawn all over them and want to take a picture but this person is inviting a different kind of fame Doing so, he's embracing it in a way that makes it a lane that's different than other athletes would choose. You're not, who's willing to go? I'm going to be the clown loudmouth and and say whatever it is that I want and say things like I'm going to lock down LeBron James because I've already realized that in the currency of today, when attention is the value, what also gets devalued is the words don't mean anything. He could say the Stugats. I'm, yeah, the words of, of yes, that is correct. The Stugats lane of maximum. My words don't mean anything. I'll just be about bluster. And if I if I play well or I don't play well, none of it matters. I get paid a bunch of money, and I'm enhancing my brand. This The clown brand's not bad for me. Dan, it's a double-edged sword. If he didn't act like that, would he have gotten an $84 million right. contract, or would he just be another guy in the league who's like, okay, bad shooter, good defender, and just another run-of-the-mill guy that makes $20 million in his career? He made $84 million. For that, I'll do it. Memphis waived him because of it. That's what it felt like. Whether that's the real story or not, Memphis had had enough of, okay, we don't want to be a clown. We don't want to have Ja and this. We're going to go. We When they talk about Ja needing the veteran leadership of that pirate Stephen Adams. Of Marcus Smart. Who's 29 years old. It's at least in part because they don't want whatever Dylan Brooks is representing to be around John Moran. Clearly, John Moran is the future of that franchise, and Dylan Brooks isn't. But the disconnect is an interesting one to me when you incentivize the clown show. Because Dylan Brooks, to me, there are 50 guys in the NBA who can give you what Dylan Brooks gives you. And a lot more offense. And you don't know any of them. Like, you don't know their names, you don't know their personality, you don't know, they don't have any brand recognition. You don't associate them with being, man, Memphis Memphis was priding itself on being the team that would fight Shannon Sharp with the Lakers. That's what they were going for. We'll, we'll fight Shannon Sharp courtside, and then they get Dylan Brooks out of there because they're like, wait a minute, we don't want T. Martin around this, we don't, uh, we don't want uh, T. Morant around this, we don't want Ja Morant around this, we don't want... T. Martin scampers for 20 yards. <laughs> In the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. I just had the Tennessee quarterback run around. He ran across my lack of confidence. Big there win a, for Philip T. Martin. <laughs> it, was, it was in an orange uniform. I like. I, I was searching for the name Morant, and as I did so, that uniform in bright orange just ran, a, trampled my confidence as it ran through my consciousness. And the volunteers are up six on your Bremen Honda scoreboard. <laughs> 
Mike Ryan is of the belief that U.S. soccer, men or women's soccer, has never before made a hire as big, as well, or as important as the one that women's soccer just made for the United States. Many in our audience may not know the name Emma Hayes because they may not follow club soccer abroad. But in Europe, Emma Hayes is reputed to be the best women's manager ever in the club game. I happen to know Emma Hayes a little bit from my time partnering up with Chelsea FC because she just so happens to presently be the uh, manager for Chelsea FC's very successful women's side. They made a tremendous hire in Emma Hayes. Emma Hayes is talked about in glowing terms, not just for her tactical uh, skill, the her ability to manage personalities. In fact, in both, I think she'd present an upgrade for the men's team too. Can she this do both? Is, <laughs> she, I wish. I wish. I wish they hired her for the men's team, too. But she is coming. She's leaving a very successful program over at Chelsea FC, a program that she built. She is leaving that to join the women's national team over here. Now, Emma Hayes has plenty of experience in the American soccer game. She cut her teeth over here in the States. She actually brings that grit, that grit, that tenacity that American soccer is supposed to be about, that the women's national team has displayed and really introduced a competitiveness that wasn't really seen on the international level. And Emma Hayes is a perfect fit. I could not be more excited. You sound where, it. Where they failed... In the men's hire. There is a worse hire. Greg Berhalter is trash. I don't like him. I don't like his tactics. I don't like his attitude. I don't like how he manages players. I don't like how he's managed his return back to the side. Just terrible. It doesn't scream we're going for it when we're hosting the, the, the World Cup. I hated the message that it sent. On the women's national team side, though, I love the message that it sent. They got the Best in the game. Who, Emma Hayes is great. Who would have been the hire that would have got you this excited for the Emma men? Hayes. <laughs> Emma Hayes. If On the men's side, Jose Mourinho maybe. I would have been really pumped up if they would have given Emma Hayes a shot on the men's side. I And I understand I'm not doing a thing here. Emma Hayes is great. What a hire. We were talking about after Vlatko was released from the contract or resigned or whatever the exact terminology was, that like – I didn't know where U.S. soccer was going to go with this hire because there wasn't an obvious choice. And I think Emma Hayes was not someone on anyone's radar. And so it is a huge hire. And there's also been reports that she may make equal to or close to what Greg Berhalter is making with no, U.S. No, no, soccer. No, 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 no. Which now you've be, gone too far. Yeah, right. Which would be, I mean, the U.S. soccer. She's far more just, accomplished. Did, she definitely. She, no, they just did a whole thing no. about equal pay for the players. So why shouldn't the yeah. coaches yeah. make equal to what the men's they coaches are. are making? They're going to probably go farther in the next World Cup. I mean, this this past World Cup was terrible for them. Yeah. But if you, if you, they're if you a much more successful squad. I, I was talking with a couple of U.S. soccer fans, and we were kind of fantasy booking. Where would they go with this managerial hire? And the name Emma Hayes was brought up in a pipe dream scenario. Even though she had ties to the U.S., she's very successful over at Chelsea, has all the job security in the world over there. So why would she come over here considering U.S. soccer kind of feels like a mess? So credit to a federation that I never give credit to. U.S. soccer nailed this you after a bunch of missteps. a reluctant creditor. Everyone knows this about you. Tony says it should be a Herb Street situation. Both jobs. Pay her the same. Coaches both. Pay her the same. Keep it nice and unjust. No, guys, get both salaries. Guys, don't ruin the Emma Hayes segment by bringing up how bad Greg Berhalter is. You did it. Let's just celebrate. No, 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 no. That's you it. Did no, no, no. This. I asked him who we I was forced hired. to do this. I was forced to do this. Look, I don't expect a lot of you guys to be following Chelsea's women's team. I don't. But trust me, if you did, you'd know she's got the goods. The, the question now, though, is who's Chelsea going to hire? They're <laughs> one of the best teams in European football, and now, like, where do you where do you go to replace her? Well, she's she, she she's is been the there program. for a long time. She, yeah, it's like a Sir Alex Ferguson type yeah, of thing. She with completely her. built it up, and now, like, where where do they go? It's an interesting <laughs> question, but the timing is going to be difficult because she is probably going to coach out the remainder of the season there, and then the Olympics are going to be right after that. So there's talk I think that she's going to come back during international breaks and do both, pull double duty. Oh. Wow. Wow. Pay her quadruple. Yeah. Pay her. Give her everything. Give her myself. Why are you She's wearing sunglasses? It's so bright in here. Man. My eyes hurt so bad. Oh, yeah. I've been yawning. My eyes have been tearing up give all day. Give us an oh yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Am I the Kool-Aid man? Who am I? No. Oh, Randy Macho Randy Savage. Randy yeah. Macho I was doing Macho Kool-Aid man. <laughs> the Macho Man. Those are two very different, uh, very different characters. Not really. I want the audience, though, to know that it means a lot that Mike is saying she's the goods because that's coming from the maker of Baker Mayfield is the goods. He's got the goods. You haven't said someone Took a couple has years, but I think he proved me right. <laughs> We talked a lot yesterday about Jason Kelsey being voted one of the people's sexiest men alive, but a far, far greater injustice happened and slipped by, which was Taylor Lautner voted the sexiest Ooh. podcast host. Taylor Taylor Lautner? You don't know who Taylor He's been on the show, Tony, like multiple times. It's Twilight, right? Twilight, yes, yeah. he was Jacob in Twilight. And he married Taylor Lautner. Yeah, his, his wife's name is also Taylor. Um, he was in the Kevin James... Sean Payton Netflix film in which we interviewed him and then the people involved in that were not very happy with us. Yeah. Is it they just because we, like, were, we were just making fun of how much Kevin James didn't look like Sean Payton? That's what correct. The, that's what no one liked about that interview. Well, we, we also objectified Taylor Lautner yeah. a, a bunch, but I, I mean, I for one am excited to see Kevin James play Connor Stallions in the upcoming biopic. <laughs> but that's a separate that's a separate story, Dan. Hmm. Sexiest podcast host Taylor Lautner. First wow. off, didn't know he had a podcast. Second off, should have been you and Stugatz. Yeah. Yep. And Every- Bullock Senior. Everybody has a podcast, and uh, I'm just I just want to make sure that so the person that we got in trouble with Netflix and Taylor for objectifying has now been named the sexiest podcaster. That is correct. Okay, just making clear that that it's offensive to find this person sexy. It's offensive. As, as we, I've been on a lot of dumb phone calls. That was that's uh, that's up there, top of the heap. That was a bad one. <laughs> I mean, the celebrity interviews. If Taylor himself was not upset. No, by this, he right? wasn't. That was the whole thing. I was like, please find out from Taylor what I said that that bothered him about our promotion of this Kevin James's Sean Payton film. And when it got to that point, there wasn't any substance there. So it was people, you know, doing I guess their job and being publicists and 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 taking offense potentially where there might not actually be any, but. You know, congrats to Taylor for being a hot piece of ass. I definitely think they were more upset about the Kevin James, T- Sean Payton commentary and the fact that we were mercilessly mocking that casting choice, which, frankly, I stand by. I yeah. watched that whole movie. Yeah. It was not believable. <laughs> that man could not beat the Chiefs last weekend. <laughs> Uh, Kevin James as Sean Payton has been a source of pretty consistent and unrelenting mockery in the sports community. That That's film what it was we became kind of the face of all that was going on. It kind of got memed, and because we brought additional attention to it, that's really where people got bothered. But no, it was all good. It's all good. You know, we've gotten Netflix people on since. I'm Ooh. asking. Have I we? don't think I could name one. Have we? How do we get Dan we on this? How do we, we get Dan on this list next year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a strike, so that's that's why. That's probably why, um, and not Dan's line of questioning. That is correct. But look, man, I, if if there's a beefcake on, we're going to call it out. You know, we probably do that a little too much, but that's fine. We did it with Jim Trotter. Thing. That was probably the worst. <laughs> I mean, the worst of them. He looks fantastic. 60? There's no way he's 60. <laughs> Six. I'm sorry. There's no Hold chance. Hold on. I, 60? It was stunning. It's it was a very stunning. serious interview. Maybe in 25 years. Maybe he's 60 and 25. It was a very serious otherwise interview, but I think the most shocking thing from that interview was not uh, the racism or the lawsuit or the discrimination. It's that Jim Trotter was smoking at 60. Hey, like just- S- S- Stav joined us, and he was promoting a Netflix yeah, special. And we didn't objectify him once, well, or his flaccid penis. I'm pretty sure I did objectify him, though. But I, I did. I, I thought that we called him the king of uh, body positivity, which is in the realm of objectifying. Can you be that when you're just constantly making fun of how soft you get? The thing that's a real problem, Mike. Uh, Jessica pointed out that I don't think we had enough uh, fun with earlier this week. Is I really did want to examine the amount of sexy in our shipping container. Like, that because you guys looked at me, everyone looked at me like I was the one making the just sad and pitiful admission that I don't wander around feeling sexy. That's not something that I have. I'm not connected to that part of my life. And I was met with a whole bunch of people staring back at me, and I was looking at you. So I see what you people look like. 
and you were staring back at me like, don't know what you're talking about. We're maximum sexy all the time. And Stugatz chief among them. And I just can't believe that Stugatz is looking at himself these days in a full length mirror when he's just in his underwear and saying, I still got it. That's not that cannot be happening. Dan, Roy's fake name when he checks into hotels is Jack Sp- Jack Slade, is that correct? Uh, Jack Spade. Jack Spade. No. I mean, you're not going to get Hold. him to say, I don't feel sexy. Hold on a second. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's my fake name is Jack Spade. Excuse me? <laughs> Why? Uh, uh, I'm going to get you sucker, I believe is where I got that from. <laughs> Attaboy. No, no, I get that part. The part that confuses why do you me need a fi- why is do you why need- are you checking <laughs> in with a fake after name? After the game with Jake Spade is such a good show. Oh, Jack, Jack, it's a fine. I like Jake better. You don't get to do Jake. That. You got it wrong. Pay the fine. Jake Spade is not better than Jack Spade. You can't say I like Jake better. It's Jack. No, Jack Spade is great. I don't understand why you need a fake name. Eh, it just sounds nice. You what know? are you worried about? Changes, change of pace. It's so when they ask for your I, ID, I, I get what Roy's doing. Whether he feels like he needs it or not, it is kind of a move to say, "Can you yeah. put that under Jack Spade?" Yeah. <laughs> but then your ID says Roy Bellamy. Well, I just, I just tell him that I went under a fake name. I mean, Charles Barkley used to do that, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, also what I you? say when I'm playing blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jess, I get the reference. Chris Cody, you've been wanting to share with the audience and the rest of us. I go by Kiki Vanderway. Oh, Never yeah. been bothered. <laughs> you've been wanting to share Minus with Beyonce. the group for a while. Uh, it's a TikTok video here that involves Josh Allen. And what uh, what is the, uh, the the roots of this or what? Joe Burrow and Josh Allen on Sunday after the game. They did the thing where the quarterbacks find each other. We're going to say what's up, give a hug. And they caught the sound of it. And you're going to hear this. And you're going to think, oh, this is just a normal interaction after a game. But pay attention to the different things Joe Burrow calls Josh Allen here. He hits him with a buddy, a brother, a pal, and a man in like a six-second clip. Let's do it. Love you, buddy. Game, brother. You too, buddy. Yeah, you too. You too, man. Thanks, pal. You too. Love you. Like, it's just, it seems so, like, sincere when you're just looking. But if you really dive down, that's too many nicknames. I'm I don't think Joe. Buddy, Bur- I don't. I don't think Joe Burrow likes Josh Allen. You would think that they like each other with that. I think Joe Burrow secretly hates Josh. He Allen. said, "Love you," at the end. Yeah, that. that was to me the main takeaway. Love you. Play it one more time, courtesy of the CW Sports. At your kindest leisure. Love you, buddy. Game, brother. You too, buddy. Yeah, I'll do this. You too, man. Thanks, pal. You too. Love you. It's the pal for me. It's the you can't pal me after you've brothered and manned me, yeah. <laughs> and buddied you, buddied you, brothered you, manned you, it's and, just, hell and yeah. it's too much. It's gone too far. I think he's covering up for something. I think he secretly hates him. I believe this in a microcosm is sports media coverage in general these days. In a video that we just showed in which he clearly said that he loves him, you are now alleging not Hates only him. that he's a liar, but it's the opposite of his yeah. actual feelings. Hey, pal. And, Come here, and, man. All right, brother. I'm with you. The pal is the one that's suspicious there. I, You go buddy, you go brother, you go man, everyone's good. But pal, pal. Condescending. Coaches. Coaches. Do it again. I need it again. <laughs> At your leisure. Love you, buddy. And Allen hit him with a brother. It's like he thought of another thing to call him. How many nicknames do we have? I don't think either one of them knows each other's name. <laughs> I don't think they, I don't think not only do they not love each other, I don't think they know each other's names. All right, man. See you, brother. All right, pal. All right, Spelling of coaches makes no sense. That's coach eyes. Pal is something that that's I that's where would, it goes too far. I well, it's just it it is it's an empty phrase that has no warmth in it. It has no love in it. To call someone pal is to be an old person. It's also Joe Burrow is always cool. I don't think of someone that age being pa- a, a pal. Only a the winning quarterback can say pal. Like if you're the losing quarterback, you don't hit someone with a pal. It's such a condescending. We just it's whooped just your respectful. ass. All right, pal. Good job. Yeah. Keep is the word so it, it's inherently condescending. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Lebetard Show. Is the word "pal" inherently condescending? Sal, pal. Yes or no? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I'm not going to kick him out. Uh, I'm I'm going to. Why? I shouldn't. I'm going to reward him because I've been kicking him out too much. Oh. And I don't want it to be one note. So I simply want to give him, and I I'm 
I, I don't want to reward what Jeremy has done this week and in general, his dad joke contributions to what we've been doing. But he has been dying to talk about Mariah Carey, and we have not given him. It's been like 10 days. He's Why? <laughs> That damn Jack Spade sent me. <laughs> I yeah. still can't. You check in. Roy, is somebody Jack. looking for you? Like, I, don't, I don't understand. Jack Spade. Roy, why are you doing this? I don't do you, know. Do you say that confidently? Roy, what do you mean you don't know? I told you it was a change of pace. <laughs> like, are you doing it ironically? Sure. But do you say it like in a serious, can you, can you reenact it? Yeah. Um, Let's do the whole thing. Hold on. Be a the second. Hotel Hold on. I'll be I'll, I'll be the whole I'll be the hotel worker who's checking you in. Be the whole. I'm not going to be the whole. Yeah. Room for two for uh, Jack Spade. This is vaguely pornographic. Well, first Dan, first Dan, you ask if There's he's checking idea. in. It's That's overtly pornographic. You're, You're the one that made the character. You have him checking into your hole. You made this, sir. Welcome to my hole. Uh, Thank what? You. How can we help you? Yeah, uh, I got a room for two for uh, Jack Spade. Do you whisper like that too? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to say it under my breath here. For uh, Jack Spade. <laughs> <laughs> the reservation is under Spade, sir. Yes. Can I see Jack some ID? Spade. Can I see some ID? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. This does not say Jack Spade, sir. I, I can't give a credit card. I cannot take the down payment to this room for Roy Bellamy for Jack Spade. Yeah, that's a, not how this is happening. <laughs> Wait, what? Fake he puts it. He puts on a voice. <laughs> it's a whispered, sensual voice. It's because he needs to sound famous, like he's trying to hide his identity, exactly. so that that way, when he walks up as Roy Bellamy, everyone's like, "Okay, now I understand why he was whispering sensually and saying Jack Spade." That would right. make me more likely to like want to rob your hotel room if I hear Jack Spade. <laughs> you should go with Roy Bellamy. Do not disturb on the door. On the door now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Roy, are you checking in with your wife? Does she know that you're Mrs. doing Spade. this? Well, Spade. She knows now. She listens to the show. God okay. damn it. All right, but not with you. She's not checking in with you. This is just you on the road. What's this her is, name? This is you. Uh... <laughs> Me we ain't come up with that yet. Spade? Kate? <laughs> None of us understand, Roy, why you're doing this. And the most appalling part of all of it is it's obvious after talking it through you have no idea why you're doing this. The Change the pace. Conversation was fun. <laughs>